Well, good morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to the 13th meeting in 2014 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee? Can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile devices as they do affect the broadcasting system? Can I welcome today Gil Patterson, who's substituting for Jim Eady? Agenda item one is EU Digital Agenda, and today I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Robert Madlin, Director General of DG Connect at the EU Commission. Mr. Madeline has a very busy schedule during his visit to Scotland, so we're delighted he's made time to come to speak to the committee this morning on European and Scottish digital matters. We anticipate this being an interesting session in light of the wide range of developments currently taking place in Scotland in relation to digital connectivity. In advance of this session, the committee sought submissions from stakeholders on the types of questions that they would like addressed today, so we're grateful to the stakeholders who put forward questions for consideration and we have drawn on some of these questions into our approach on evidence taking today. Can I also welcome Jamie McGregor to the meeting from the European and External Affairs Committee. And Mr Madeline, can I invite you to make some opening remarks? Thank you very much, Chairman. And, and may I say that for me it's, uh, it's perfect that not only that I can meet the committee but that it's been prepared in the way you described because the the purpose of somebody like me wandering around Europe is to get away from the ivory tower in Brussels, but to find out what's going on and what, what we're missing at the European level. So, so I'm very pleased to have the committee's time. Uh, to, to be brief, uh, the, the Digital Agenda for Europe was launched in the first year of the Barroso II College, and that college is now at the end of its five-year mandate. Hopefully, on the 1st of November, the new team will be in place. And uh, this is therefore a moment when we look at what has happened, what has surprised us, and what are we missing. So what is happening in the area of most concern to this committee around infrastructure is that uh, connectivity is improving across Europe. Uh, what we are missing, I think, is a sense that the speed of uh, infrastructure rollout in, in almost all the member states be fast enough to meet growing business and societal needs. So on the one hand, we're getting there rather slowly, and on the other, the question emerges, is there, is there now a, a measurable gap between where any society, any community in Europe needs to be to attract new investment, to build jobs and, and a strong society, and where we are? And I think that uh, in this area of electronic infrastructure, as everywhere else, uh, Europe, not uniquely in the world, is underweight in infrastructure spending. If you compare this to the golden age of rail, when people were investing in the late 19th century a lot of uh, the riches of uh, Britain in railways, some of which only survived 20 or 30 years, some of which were vanity projects, you could argue with a very treasury look that then money was being wasted, but actually the infrastructure was there. And if you're growing a garden, you want to allow things to grow a bit and then you prune them back. And that's what we were doing in those days. If you come forward to today, I would argue that we are uh, billions short of the rate of investment we need. That doesn't necessarily mean the taxpayer's money should be used to bridge the gap, although that's the model being followed in some other places like South Korea and Australia. But we need to be very conscious that there is a gap. Uh, then the question arises... Should we wait until the need is demonstrated or should we build it so that they may come? And I think that there is a, a, a sort of uh, economic strategy challenge there. One choice is let's build it and see what grows around 100 megabit connectivity, rather like a motorway. And another is more cautious to leave it to the market. Uh, the difficulty with the market in this field, as we all know, is that we have a market which is not competitive. Electronic communications is a rootedly uncompetitive market. That's why we have organisations like Ofcom across Europe, why we have ex ante and not ex post competition rules. And so it's very hard to generate market-led investment at sufficient levels in a market which is not fully contestable. So I think that on the infrastructure side, we can say that we have more to do. If I look more broadly, uh, which would be my second big message, I think that when I took this job in 2010 and we launched the strategy, a lot of people around Europe said, yes, we know digital is nice to have, but 
Isn't it interesting that it's coming first among the uh, strategic initiatives of this college? People were a bit surprised. And I think in the subsequent years, whether it's the OECD, McKinsey, the Boston Consulting Group, the idea that digital is crucial to the su survival of any society has gone completely mainstream. I really think that there's been a shift in the recognition that digital is everywhere and we need to have it in our mindset, whatever our core business is. Uh, but even there, I think we can highlight some uh, lacunae which we need to work on. One is skills. Digital literacy, whether it's for retired or older people or for the under 10s, is still inadequate. Coding clubs, putting programming as a core part of the curriculum, having a very clear map of where business needs are not met by our education system. That's one problem. A second is getting SMEs IT ready, which doesn't mean buying them a new computer, because most SMEs need to change their business model and then they can sell to more new markets better. And that can work right down to the micro-enterprise. We've had some very interesting experiments, for example, in rural Connemara, where a few hundred euros here and there for... Uh, people to understand how their co literally cottage enterprise can get online transforms their prospects. And the third area, I think, which is more on the individual consumer uh, and citizen angle, is that neither e-government nor e-commerce are growing as a proportion of the way we live our lives as fast as we think they could, or as fast as we see they are growing in countries where the infrastructure is stronger, the skills are there, and the self-confidence is higher, like, for example, Norway. So I think that going forward, my sense is that the next College of Commissioners, we will need not just to have a strong digital commissioner in Brussels, but to have a digital college, a digital, I hope, president of the College of Commissioners, so that in every area, the digital aspects of the transformation we need, whether it's education or infrastructure, or, or, or business uh, strategy will come first, so that in 2015 we will level up rather fast some of the areas of policy that have been lagging in the last four or five years and hope to do better. And I think everything I've said is directly relevant to Scotland, which as, as a country in some areas such as e-health is a European leader, I mean, literally not just being ahead but helping to coordinate work uh, in places like the ICT team in the University of Edinburgh is, again, I think, a global as well as a European beacon. Um, and I think that, therefore, uh, most of what I've said is directly relevant to Scotland. And my sense is that many of the policies being rolled out in the country are pretty much in line with what I'm saying. So I don't have a sense of coming to teach anybody anything, but seen from where we are at the European level, I think those are the strengths and weaknesses we've discovered in the last three, four years' journey. Thank you very much. Alex, would you like to start off the questioning? Yes, you, you made it clear uh, in your opening remarks that you're here to listen, you're here to uh, gain the experience of uh, people in Scotland. Um, but would it be possible for you to give us very briefly the key priorities on your side uh, for the development of the digital agenda? So, so the first priority, and I'm not saying it because I'm before this committee, is the infrastructure conundrum. Uh, we have in the last three, four years got to 96, 97% coverage for basic broadband, which means you know, achingly slow connectivity. And we have put out a model uh, where satellite can fill the gaps. The next step, which is 30 megabits per second, is extremely complex, both from an investment and from a technological point of view. And there are well understood controversies, including in Scotland, whether the copper infrastructure will allow you to get to 30 megabits per second if the, the distance from the cabinet to the home is more than uh, three quarters of a mile. So uh, that area is really difficult, and the political will has been tested in the budgetary debate last year, where we proposed a 7 billion euro um, novel financing instrument to help member states and regions plug the gaps, and we got zero. Uh, we haven't given up. We've put 150 
uh, million of our, if you like, of our own uh, independent research money on that from a different heading to try with some pilot projects to show that it, it is an area worth funding, not necessarily out of the EU budget. So that is a remaining uh, major theme. At the other extreme, I think the whole digital citizen and skills agenda is the other major theme. If the people get it, then the politics at local level will also change in favour of the sorts of infrastructure and IT transformation we need. So if I had to just give two pillars, those would be the pillars, getting it right for people and getting the infrastructure right. These are two issues we've discussed before uh, on this committee. But how do you feel Scotland is measuring up against these priorities? So on the infrastructure side, um, my sense is that the, uh, the, the BDUK, the Highlands and Islands uh, schemes are uh, pushing in the right direction. I think that the, the, the answer in every town depends on the length of the copper wire, how old it is, and how many people want to use it, and therefore there's a degree of deep knowledge which is needed, which is probably not available to public authorities anywhere in Europe in a perfect way. And I don't even know that the incumbents have done their homework in that degree of detail. But I think that uh, the, the big challenge, especially in a country with some very sparsely populated as well as some very densely populated areas, is to get a detailed enough map to make public policy choices about exactly where the money should go. But if I look across the, the structural funds programming agreements for the UK, which are now under discussion, and I look at what's being funded under Scottish and, 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 and UK uh, schemes, it's all pushing in the right direction. But the people I've met in previous visits and also in Brussels from, from the west of Scotland say, yeah, but every time we're, we're due to come last and then people go back to the beginning and start a new piece of technology, so we're still lagging. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are examples of bottom-up community schemes on some of the islands where the existence of some high-speed public access fibre has enabled individual villages to connect themselves at 100 megabits per second at very low cost per household. So there are, there are different models out there. I think in that sense you could say uh, Scotland is a laboratory. It sort of leads me to the final question I was going to ask, and that is, do you think we in Scotland, um, through the mechanisms available to us, including the actions of government, uh, are doing the right things to support the right progress, or are there areas where we could do more? In my, in my previous job, I was dealing with health, and it struck me there that Scotland was, in a way, just the right size to have very strong community roots for a very vibrant policy. People understood what was going on. In the e-health field, I think you can see that strength coming through in, in IT. On, on e-communications infrastructure, I don't, I don't know, but I don't see a signal that says the incumbent providers and the IT teams in the Scottish Government are working on the, the rural end as hard as you are working on some of the lighthouse projects around, for example, Glasgow and Edinburgh. So I, I would say that, as often in public policy, the picture is one of light and shade. But if there was a piece that I felt probably a country like Scotland needed to look at carefully, it would be the, the rural connectivity because, as even the Financial Times was saying this morning, proximity to big cities is still very important. So Scotland has big cities. The, the second highest growing wealth rates on this chart I saw this morning in the UK after London was Edinburgh. But there's, there's a need to use the new infrastructure to ensure that distance becomes a zero handicap in the future, which it can, and not a heavy handicap as it used to be. I think um, digital infrastructure should be seen as a utility, like water and energy provision. Yes, it's clear to me that, that, uh, that communications infrastructure is a public good. Then you, whether you run it as a utility owned by the state, financed by the taxpayer and open to all, or you find some other uh, mixed economy 
uh, solution for provision, that's a, a different question. And the Treaty of Rome and every treaty since has always said we leave that to people outside Brussels to choose. But it's definitely a utility, and it is a crucial public good for the survival of our societies in the future. I was thinking in terms of uh, new housing developments or new... Well, it almost always does go into new industrial developments, but it doesn't always go in in, in terms of new housing developments. No, precisely. So on that, uh, we have legislated in the life of this college at European level, so it's, it's being rolled out in the year ahead. It, we just finished before Christmas. In the, the, the reducing the costs of civil um, expenditure, civil infrastructure, within the overall broadband um, cost structure. Because typically, 80% of the cost of putting a kilometre of fibre in the ground is digging holes, getting access to ducts, and so on. So what we've agreed among all the member states is to uh, require mapping of where the ducts are and to require that new builds are, uh, by default, open to um, high-tech, infrastructure, including some fibre cable, it, it's still not self-evident. If I go back to Norway, because I was visiting there recently as well, even in a country as well-managed as Norway, every province has a different rule about how deep you have to bury the cable. So you can't calibrate your digging machine the same way and run it from the south to the north. And I guess that similar narrow differences in, in areas like how wide is the road, where do you put the ducts, are handicaps uh, also in, in Scotland. So I think there are, there are problems, but I think that increasingly you get it acknowledged that houses will sell better, will be more attractive if they have good connectivity, and may, may be up to 20% um, uh, lower in value if they don't have good connectivity um, for, for e infrastructure. Thanks. Um, Gil, you're next. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, good morning. I, I wonder if you could tell us how you think Scotland's uh, comparing against uh, or performing against other European countries. So uh, I think if you look at the, you can look right down at the, at the sort of uh, county or, or regional level within Scotland and on, still on the broadband infrastructure, uh, the, the, the coverage goes from 90 to 0%. So, so you, you can see if you, I mean, everybody has a telephone, but if you go above, if you look towards 10, 20, 30 megabits, um, there are still parts, mainly of the highlands and islands, where nobody gets that speed. And that may not be true for some leased lines for business, and it may not be true for some hospitals or schools, but in, in general. And then if you look at the, if you look at Dundee, Perth, Glasgow, Aberdeen, uh, Edinburgh, it's fine. So I think that, that you have to look at that granular level. The average of a series of experiences between 0 and 90 doesn't tell you very much. And I think overall you can say you know, Scotland in, as an average, even the UK as an average, it's, it's, it's more or less in the middle. It's not Romania and it's not Norway. But there are bits of uh, Scotland which are like Romania and bits that are like Norway. And that's the important point, I think. The, the, the range of experience is the biggest it can be. In a kind of general picture, are we catching up or are we slowing up? Is there something you could talk, tell us about that? Are, yeah. are we... So, so you know, the civil servants are forever failing to give the clear answer that, that political decision makers need to questions like that. Um, there are things which you are doing in Scotland which are absolutely the best in class. Trying out affordable high-speed infrastructure in every flat in a high-rise block in a poor part of Glasgow or Edinburgh. That's, that's huge in what you can learn about how to get disadvantaged people connected to real opportunity. At the other extreme, if you can't get even a sort of dial-up functional access to the BBC website when you're staying at a hotel somewhere in the northwest. That's a drag on the market. People will say that makes it a very quaint place to go, but you know certain categories of people will find that a problem. So, I think that the good the good stuff is the best in class, and the rural connectivity. It's a challenge for every part of Europe with rural problems. If you look at the countries with e 
even a higher proportion of sparsely populated territory than Scotland, so you, the Nordic neighbours, the only way they fix that is by putting more public money into it, at, at municipal as well as at national level. Thanks for that. Uh, can you, uh, can, uh, how can uh, Connecting Europe be used to support the digital agenda in Scotland? So the Connecting Europe facility was the uh, was the was in two parts. This was a budgetary proposal that we made in the in the last multiannual financial round in Brussels, and we proposed firstly uh, six seven billion for the infrastructure rollout. And as I as I said, the answer to that was near to zero. We proposed a second thread, which is about collective. Um, e-government public service infrastructure, what we call DSI, digital service infrastructure. And there we got pretty much what we wanted, which is three billion, not to provide e-government across the whole of Europe, but to provide a common hub, common hosting and a common toolbox so that people can at lowest possible cost offer e-procurement, e-identity, uh, e-health services across borders, but then because you're doing it together across borders, you end up doing it with the best practice from around Europe being shared more quickly. So on that side, uh, the digital agenda for Europe is being served by a part of the, um, the expenditure that's, that's new in the, this EU budget compared to any previous planning. Okay, thanks very much for that. Okay, Gordon. Okay, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I want to continue discussing the situation regarding funding in the broadband infrastructure. And uh, the Carnegie Trust produced a report last year going the last mile, how can broadband reach the final 10%? And um, the author stated in that, that it must be recognised that supplying the final 10% with NGA services on an equivalent level to those available in urban areas will cost several billion pounds. And this cost is unlikely to be met through normal market forces. Assuming that a straightforward grant funding mechanism is unaffordable for most states, what solutions are emerging to finance the provisions of digital infrastructure connections to the most remote areas of Europe? So, uh, if I start with technology, uh, 4G mobile is going to get you there faster than um, tweaking the copper. Uh, 4G rollout is starting rather slowly in the UK as a whole, largely because of spectrum allocation. We're assured it's going to catch up. Uh, so that would be one way whereby you can begin to build solutions. The, the second is to concentrate the public money not on the last mile, but on the backbone, so that you get uh, access backbone into the local community, and then you allow the local community to do it themselves in terms of digging out from the backbone and either through radio or through other solutions, building their own local network. The difficulty on that is that the, uh, the commercial backbone is not generally made available, so this is a commercial <laughs> choice, to these sorts of um, collectivist approaches. But when they're properly done, these collectivist approaches are extraordinarily cost-effective and they work and it's good community building. And there are these great examples around the Isle of Mull, for example, I was mentioning the Tegula system. So I think that the, if you can't simply throw taxpayers' money at the whole solution, part of it is pushing faster deployment of the newest technologies and part of it may be going into the backbone level and making sure that there's, there's a point of contact rel relevant, relatively close to each community so that the community themselves can begin to decide whether this is the priority or replacing the school bus or whatever. But are there any lessons that Scotland could learn from the likes of Iceland, Norway or Sweden who uh, all have higher uptake of internet users than, than Scotland but have lower population densities? Hmm. So they're very rich countries. They have quite a strong uh, municipal budget layer, uh, and they, they, they haven't done what South Korea or Australia have done. They haven't put up satellites or paid for all the fibre themselves at, 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 at taxpayer level. But they, are, they have deeper pockets than anybody uh, around here, I, th I fear, as public authorities. 
The, the other aspect, which I think is very striking in a place like Sweden, is that uh, the, the offer has been very attractive to consumers. Music streaming has been a huge success in Sweden. Most royalties that um, music copyright owners make in Sweden from us listening to their music are now made from streaming services rather than from us downloading from iTunes or buying CDs or anything like that. And I think that bundling together of content services with um, phone subscriptions is something which hasn't quite taken off yet in other markets. Now, why does something sell better in one market than another first? It's very hard to judge. But the, what, what the Swedish regulator always says to me is part of this, Robert, is it gets dark in, in Sweden earlier than it does in Brussels. And so some of the features that drive the Swedish model might work in Scotland as well. Um, just one point relating to, you were saying, there were a, a Richard, the Royal Society of Edinburgh produced a report spreading the benefits of digital participation, just published uh, in April there, and it actually suggests that GDP per capita for Iceland, Sweden and Scotland are exactly the same at $41,000 uh, per, per, per head. So um, I don't think that should be a factor. Um, however, the, my final question is, is there any methods of European funding uh, available to assist in the provision of broadband infrastructure in hard-to-reach rural and island areas such as those in Scotland? So, so in, in passing, just to note on your GDP per capita figure, it may be that household incomes, if you look at relative household incomes, maybe it's not the same figure. So, so you, you have to net out the, the mineral resources wealth. Uh, if you look at uh, what can Europe do, uh, you, personally, you know, I'm sad we didn't get the, the new line specifically for broadband, but despite not having that, one of the operational objectives under the structural funds is around ICT, and I think that the, the, the programming discussions now going on covering Scotland would include some ICT in the bid from uh, from, from Scotland and from London in terms of what you want to spend the money on. As you know, this is a kind of awkward negotiation where the, the, the country makes the bid, but my colleagues in the Commission get to complain about it. And I think it's, it's a matter of public record uh, that Commissioner Hahn, who's the guy in charge, doesn't much want to spend the structural funds on infrastructure. He wants to spend them on skills or other stuff. Uh, we've not supported that line, but you don't win all the interministerial fights, even in Brussels. And so it's not clear as of today where that negotiation will come out, which means there's everything to play for. And I'm sure that your um, colleagues in the Scottish uh, team on Rompuy Schumann are, are fighting that battle quite hard. Thank you so much. Jamie, you want to come in on this? Well, there are a couple of things. Thanks very much. Um, yes, I, I represent Highlands and Islands. I'm, I'm an MSP for Highlands and Islands region, um, which, of course, goes from the south end of Kintyre to the most northerly Shetland Island. And um, it, so it's over half the landmass of Scotland with only about half a million people uh, and very scattered population. Now, I, and we are facing, in some areas, very significant population decreases, which are very worrying. And I'm, in fact, going to a summit on Friday about uh, population decrease in, in Argyle, which is one particular area. Now, I happen to live myself in what you described as the, the Romanian areas, <laughs> one of the Romanian areas of, of, of Argyle, and uh, I know how desperate it is, um, you know, if you're trying to get broadband, or to, to run any business too, I mean, especially a tourism business, where you have to get back to people straight away. So I suppose my question to you is, um, the first one is, I mean, you may have covered this, is how can the EU help get reliable broadband to the most remote rural communities who still face a wait of years, uh, you know, even if, to, to, to get it? I mean, what can they, you know, is there anything that can be done for these people uh, in order to sort of stop this depopulation, which is, I'm sure is related to this? And the other question is, um, what's your view on rural constituents having to pay significantly more for satellite for satellite broadband services uh, than 
the rest of the population. If I start with the second question, because that's news to me. I mean, I guess that's a commercial uh, decision. Uh, it will charge you more to send the man to screw the satellite dish onto your house. That I could understand a bit. But I think the refusal to supply is, is a real problem, uh, even for sort of parcel post-type deliveries in, in your constituency, because I have friends who live there. And, and it's not clear to me that it should be okay to refuse to supply within a territory. After all, if it's a community, you should supply. If, if there is also a difference being imposed on consumers because they have no choice, so somebody providing satellite is charging a higher subscription just because they know they're not competing against a, 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 a BT package, I would say that's probably something for the competition authorities. I mean, that's, a, that's again, a political matter because the, the consumer is vulnerable and, and the, the vulnerability is being exploited. But I don't know the facts in order to judge whether it's one or the other or both. But it seems to me clear that for satellite services like everything else, there should be a fair price. And I think one of the issues, uh, the, the list I gave of things we haven't fixed was, was short. One of the issues I think we haven't yet focused on sufficiently is the, the specific characteristics of the digital consumer problem in all its areas. Because being a consumer in the digital age is, is difficult in different ways than being a consumer in the bricks and mortar age. And the consumer policy, consumer protection models that we tend to apply are still very bricks and mortar. So I think your satellite case is, is a, an interesting case study. So I mean, I'd be interested to look a bit more at that. On, on your first point, um, I, I, I think I have not so much to add. I, I, I would really hesitate because I've never been responsible for territorial connectivity to say, yes, the answer is this. But I think that what would probably be a, a fruitful road of inquiry, and, and we would be happy to try to put people together, would be to see at, at the local level uh, between the northern bits of Norway or Sweden, for example, and, and your constituency, how did they manage? It didn't all come down miraculously from Stockholm and Oslo. A lot of it comes from the, the political but also practical actions in the middle levels. And it may well be that making the case much more strongly for some very specific rollout, put a piece of fibre from here to here, and then in return we will be doing this, would unlock financing decisions which, when you're looking at the overall large numbers, you tend to put immediately in the too difficult category. So it may be that there are, there are lessons to learn between the successes and problems of different rural communities uh, in Scotland and in neighbouring countries. Can I just have one more? Um, uh, just, I, I sit on the European and External Affairs Committee, and a while ago we did... Uh, um, um, look into the uh, you know we had a thing on Horizon 2020 and in that um, I noticed that the you, you mentioned Commissioner Hahn not being very keen on spending money on communications um, actually you know having looked at it it did appear that the, the budget for uh, communications had been cut uh, has it actually been cut in, in terms of and if so by how much so Horizon 2020, if, if other members of the committee are not, are, not detail, are not looking in detail at this, is the new framework program for research and innovation. Um, and I, in my department, am responsible for spending the, the ICT chunk of research money. And the, the trend is still relentlessly upwards. It's one of the success stories, I think, of the European budget decisions last year that at a time of austerity and cuts, research grew. So overall research grew. And within that growth, uh, ICT does continue to grow. 2014 is a lean year. There's a little dip, which is traditional in the budgetary cycle, that uh, we tend over seven years to start low and build up. So 2013 was the highest year of the last framework program, and we start a little bit lower. But the long-term trend is, is still up. And crudely, that means we're spending... Um, a, a, a good way north of a billion euros a year in part funding of 
projects, therefore, that are worth more or less two billion a year across Europe. Uh, and I think that the, uh, within that, our spending on the next generation, so 5G connectivity, the Internet of Things, remains a, a big theme for us. Uh, we think that the, uh, the way in which uh, e-connectivity will affect not just communities, but the factories of the future, the design uh, value chains of the future, this requires a lot of work, but we can win in these areas. Europe still has some really world-class uh, strengths. I've already mentioned the University of Edinburgh, but there's Dundee in gaming and others around uh, the neighbouring countries in areas around semiconductor chips and so on. So, so there are real strengths there. So I would say that we didn't get everything we asked for. Uh, we were hoping for... Uh, well, our, our dream, including the CEF, would have been more like 16 billion and we got about 12. So we got less than we asked for, but more than we've been spending in the past. Did you want to come in on this? The, the subject of competition uh, was raised yeah. there briefly. And I wonder if there was anything uh, that needed to be said on that subject. Now, the, I recently, only recently, discovered that BT... Uh, uh, in their provision of broadband have a dual pricing policy in which they have one price for areas in which they are the monopoly infrastructure provider and a different pricing structure in areas where there is a competitive uh, infrastructure in place. Is that kind of practice uh, a positive or a negative when it comes to the development of uh, infrastructure and services? So, so I think that uh, my, the the first thought that goes through my head is that in some, in some areas you have uh, local scrutiny from the competition experts, and I'm not sure that Ofcom has a, a strong presence uh, north of the border, and maybe there's a problem there, because this sort of granularity is probably invisible from where they are sitting on the River Thames. Um, and I think that overall they would take the view, and, and my competition colleagues would take the view, that uh, it's a market, so if you think you can sell uh, for more in, in town than in the country or vice versa, you, you can do it up to a point. And the question is whether, you, whether the point is passed. In competition terms, that means are you abusing a dominant position? And if you are, then that, that would be a problem. So I would say, not as a competition expert, but instinctively, that if, if, if the situation is indeed as clear as you were to describe it, then a competition authority sh should be taking an interest in that. But I think at the other extreme, we've learned in the past that price fixing by bureaucrats is probably also not an efficient way of getting services to customers. So this is a, a, a colossally difficult area. We are asking ourselves the question, I think, not just... Uh, in, in my bit of the commission, but more generally, whether the new technologies, so beyond just connection services, uh, but also the sort of the Google story, are creating new forms of distortion of consumer and B2B competition that need new sorts of attention. And this is a very hot political debate among competition authorities at the moment. Uh, my, my competition opposite number... Uh, made a speech recently saying basically the way we tackled the Microsoft browser monopoly and now the Google search monopoly show that the, the fundamental structure of competition law is fit for purpose. I am still thinking about whether that's entirely true or not. I don't think you need to change the fundamental concepts of dominance, abuse of dominance. But for example, uh, at the moment we take current market share, which means last year's market share, as the indicator for dominance. If the market share is growing like this, they may become dominant before you notice. And so you need slightly more uh, agile techniques, to say the least. And as your example shows, you need also to dig deeper to have a definition of the market which is small enough to capture um, the practices of companies. Adam. OK. Um... I was going to ask about, um, you'd mentioned the 2020 Horizon um, project and, and your support for the connectivity element of that. Um, 
Could you perhaps uh, expand a little on what's being done to support innovation and emergent technologies which could complement broadband coverage? Uh, you hinted at uh, 4G as being a particular uh, benefit in terms of enhancing mobile internet access, although I have to say I have a constituency, not in the Highlands and Islands, uh, which has quite a number of not spots in it in terms of mobile phone coverage. So um, is there anything by way of support from Europe to deal with these particular issues? So um, one of the areas which all member states and the United Kingdom is no exception want to keep very uh, subsidiaire, very much in national hands, is spectrum management. And it is one of the uh, tragedies of the commons, I think, in, in Europe that, as a result, we have extremely uh, diverse and slow uh, management and deployment of spectrum. Uh, spectrum is a limited resource, and the needs for it are changing. At the moment, we have vast over-monopolization of spectrum compared to need by... Uh, the, the public services, including the armed services, in all member states. So there's a sort of lagging inefficiency there. And we also probably have extra costs across Europe because the, uh, the, the, the 3 and 4G uh, spectrum allocation is in different places in different countries, which led, for example, the, the, the IFA, Phone five, I think, to be to be sold everywhere else, but not in Europe for six or twelve months because they couldn't be bothered to put enough antenna in the machine to make it work in Europe. So, uh, if I start from the spectrum management place, I believe we could do a lot to enable more rapid deployment of the best available technologies for mobile if we had a, the courage to manage this extremely delicate resource together. There's a proposal on the table in the Parliament and Council as we speak to, to push in that direction. The resistance is predictably huge, and we'll see where we get to after the European elections. But I think that's one of the very rare cases where we haven't yet got to an efficient balance in terms of managing a, uh, a borderless resource in a coordinated way. Secondly, uh, I think the, the next technologies so 5G, we have to win a game where we won one, we won one round. The current technologies, the, the specifications in the phones we use today were built in Europe, and every time we buy a phone, royalties trickle back to European coffers. 4G, not the same. That was more or less invented elsewhere by a, an essentially Asian coalition. 5G, we want to win. We, nobody knows what 5G is. 5G means the next more efficient mobile transmission technology. And we're putting a lot of money into that. We have a, a strategic partnership between public and private research institutions and companies. And I, I think, well, let's see. Everybody's trying to find that next best, best thing. The, the other way to go is to say maybe the answer is radically different. We won't have mobile telephone connection or fixed lines. We'll have small cell Wi-Fi type solutions, which would enable a different configuration and different cost structures, which might mean that it costs less to put high speed in a village in uh, a sparsely uh, populated area. It might. This requires experimentation uh, across the water in Ireland, in the Republic. Uh, they are saying, come to us, we have sparsely populated areas, we can be a living lab for the deployment of new approaches. If, as I hear, there may be some sparsely populated areas in Scotland, Scotland could be also a living lab for some of these approaches. So those are just three ideas. And is there any European support for, for uh, the living lab proposals? Yes. I mean, we, have, I mean, we, we, we will have as part of our... Uh, spectrum use research, so here I'm talking about Horizon 2020, not about regulation of current spectrum, uh, we will have within the partnership um, opportunities for people to, to, well, we do it by calls. So you, you re respond to a call by saying, here we have a coalition of 
people researching in 5G, people who are able to build an experimental something across a vast empty tract of hill country and islands, and we think this is an efficient way to advance the research. I personally believe that if we look at, you look at the, the, the different ways people talk about research in ICT, it's not about, it's not so much about just pieces of metal anymore. We do have at the top end um, a lot of research on the next generations of chips where not the, not the sort of big production chips but the more specialised stuff we think Europe can win there. We have around the 5G technologies some research but then downstream a lot more attention I think will be paid in research and innovation to how can the Internet of Things be configured and made to work. It's not all about your fridge talking to the supermarket. It may be more complicated. What is a really smart community, whether it's a village or a city? Uh, what, what does, what does e-health really mean in a situation? And so I think the, the, the need to have embedded research, to do research with real people in real places, is I, a, a very strong thread in, in the new approach we're now trying to roll out, which means the authorities that, in a way, own the territory become the missing partner in the research landscape. And concretely, in the, Euro in the European Innovation Partnership on Active and Healthy Ageing, where Health Scotland and uh, research institutes in Scotland are a leading actor, that was the, the, the breakthrough in the last three years to bring the regional health authorities and hospital managers into the picture so that we weren't inventing things in laboratories without any attention to whether it would work in real life. And the same will be true, I think, for mobile connectivity. Fascinating stuff, but um, can I perhaps change tack a little um, and ask, given the significant financial contribution by the Scottish and UK governments, do the state aid rules have any consequences for the work on expansion of digital infrastructure in Scotland? I think the answer is the state aid rules always get in the way. I've never worked in that field. Uh, and in the last three years, I, I think that uh, in the case of Birmingham, which you may have followed from afar, um, the application of the state aid rules was one of the obstacles to success for a, for a rollout plan in that city. Uh, in practice, the system it was so slow to give a clear answer that I think uh, Birmingham and London policy just, just went another route. And we now have the ICT vouchers for SMEs. We now have the, the BDUK schemes which are in place, including in Scotland. I think that the, the revision in the last two years of the state aids guidelines is exactly in the right direction. We were very pleased with that from a user perspective. And so I think that the, the risks are lower in the future than in the past. But there are also ways to avoid problems which not all member states use. Some member states, but this would not be one of them, have an upfront strategy about support for infrastructure that they get approved by the competition state aids people in Brussels and then everything that is just an application of the strategy is very easily ticked through. If you come with ad hoc proposals, not only is the resource available to study them inadequate, so they pile up in somebody's in-tray, but they are each scrutinised with a rather more uh, attention than is the case if you're sitting within a pre-ordained strategic framework. So I think that th that goes back to what I was saying about um, having leadership at close enough to the territory because if if there were a Scottish vision on our broadband priorities and with the stakeholders support it said these are the priorities and that was approved by probably now Mr Almunia's successor individual applications of such a vision would be much more readily managed from a state aids perspective than if you come individually saying and now this is something for the highlands and islands and now we have something for smart cities and now we have something for uh, the gaming industry i mean how did we how did the uk government get into the situation that it was breaching um rules 
uh, on the super connected cities thing because you know we've got uh, Edinburgh s trying trying out the, the voucher scheme um, and for Aberdeen you know it's not looked upon as being the best way of, of helping businesses in that city so and, and it's set back you know the timing has, has slipped as a result how did the UK government get into that situation? Well, of course, I, I may hold a British passport, but it's more than my life's worth to <laughs> give a direct answer to such a question. Um, and, and part of the answer would be what I sometimes caricature as being administrative sociology. I think that the, the existence of uh, BDUK, the DCMS mandate, the location of the state aid's expertise in biz, uh, there are quite a lot of actors around... Whitehall in this area. Uh, but I think, the, the, as I say, the, the piece of advice which I think we can distill from the experience is the, the one I've just uh, given, which is you need a strategic view up front. You need a political vision which you enunciate, you take to clear through the state aid's uh, obstacles or jump over the hurdles, and then it, may, it becomes much easier and I think part of the problem here was just the, the speed of action. I think that the, uh, the, initial, the initial political statements of, of, of vision, were, there was a missing link maybe in, in the engagement with, with the state aids authorities. But that said, if you, look at, if you look at the UK as a whole, as well as Scotland, as I was saying earlier, compared to others across Europe, I don't think it would be accurate to say and so because this particular episode re resulted in lost time everything is going badly things are going well as well okay um we'll move on to digital participation we've got a number of questions on that and we'll need to speed up a bit because we've only got less than half an hour um left so uh, mary you were going to start off on this yes, um, thank you convener and good morning and i'd like to explore a bit more of the balance between building the infrastructure and building the skill set and last year, the Scottish Government published its report, Scotland's Digital Future. And the government is committed to ensuring that business and individuals have the skills that they need and that we also have a thriving digital economy. But has too much attention been given to building the infrastructure at the detriment to building the skill set? Or have we got the balance right? So uh, you need lots of both. So I don't think I can make a very fine-tuned judgment whether the balance in Scotland is right or wrong. What, what I could say is that I think the, um, the good and the bad news on the skill set size, side is that even the sorts of countries that we think are tremendously efficient find it very, very hard. And if I take the example of Singapore, which is small, very government-driven, quite successful in this area, I, on the one hand, they have a very strong top-down vision that digital literacy is the fourth R, as they put it, and has to be a priority. And on the other, when you talk to the officials who've been responsible for this, they say the things which everybody else says, which is, you know, the teachers may not get it and don't want to be forced to do it, and so you need a very clever, attentive, sustained effort in terms of teaching the teachers, training the trainers, incentivizing, but also making it safe for people who... Uh, are coming from age groups that don't necessarily get it, you know, like mine and, and beyond, um, and helping them to look good in class. Because it, it must be rather... It's probably always scary being a teacher, but if the kids all get it and you don't and you're expected to teach them coding or programming, that's really scary. And so I think that if there's one area where we haven't really bitten the bullet, it would be that. Um, I think Finland is the only country, or it's definitely the first, that's gone in depth in terms of integrating IT into the curriculum beyond sort of how do you use PowerPoint, boys and girls. Uh, we haven't really engaged at the teacher training level. How do we make sure that every... It's not, it's not rocket science. You could, you could say every teacher in the next year will do one of its training of their training weeks on this IT stuff, and then we take it from there. I think one of the great things about the, the strengths of the ICT faculty at Edinburgh University is the way they go out in the, to the community and their postdocs are running the coding clubs. 
So that sort of thing, the multiplier effect, is also important. The people who know how need to be giving back now into the community. And I think that the, uh, the other thing that I perceive very strongly, and I'm neither a programmer nor a musician, is it's similar. The things that make IT work in people's minds, it's similar to understanding music. So the sorts of strengths that Scottish communities have around making music seem aspirational, easy, accessible to everybody, you could apply those same um, community-based approaches to making IT more than just um, video games and, and PowerPoint. Do you know if there are measures available that people can use to assess their digital literacy? So individuals particularly can measure where they have gaps in their skill set? Um, are there online diagnostic tools? I don't know, to be honest. I mean, I'm sure there are because you can find everything mm. online. Um, but I think that it, it raises a, a more important question, which is what is the skill set? It's not a block. I mean, you, it, it is like reading, writing, and arithmetic at the basis. But I think what we have to overcome is the notion that being digitally skilled either means PowerPoint or being Steve Jobs. At every level of educational attainment and in every job, there is a digital literacy skill set that you need. And what employers are saying to us, and it can be startups or SMEs or big companies, is we find that there's a gap at every level. And so that's why you have to start right at the bottom of the educational foundations, i.e. with the teachers, because it's not just teaching the people who are good at maths to become programmers, it's teaching even those of us who are not good at maths to be digitally literate. And I think that tells you something then about the answer to the question, what are my gaps? Everybody will have a gap. It's not like we're trying to pre-select the, the next generation of Alan Turing's. Yeah, but it really means that it's for everybody. And that's why I think it, it, the, 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 the first thing is that the leaders of a society need to say that that is the case. So that's the first thing that Singapore has done and we have not. To actually say that this is not just nice to have or aspirational, it's not like a driving license, it's like reading. Mm. Now, if we're honest, in every country in the developed world, we have much more illiteracy than we like to admit. So we're not saying we can snap our fingers and fix digital illiteracy either. But, but <coughs> everything will flow from a, from a political leadership vision that this is for everybody. It's not just for the bright people. It's not just for those who are good at maths. It's not just for those who are going to university. So, and that leads very nicely on to um, my last um, question, and it is around what responsibility should government then have to drive um, the, the development of digital skills? Should it be an assist role? Should it be more a controlling role? Um, and if I think about the, the use of digital infrastructure with SMEs, about 60% of Scottish um, SMEs use the internet, um, if we look at voluntary organisations, and voluntary organisations more often than not provide support to people that are excluded and disadvantaged. So should more support be given to organisations like SMEs and, and, and voluntary organisations? Yeah, so I think, I, I personally believe that this, this whole area, not just the hardware but the skills, is an area of, of public good and therefore government has to make it its business to ensure that these public goods are at the hands of all citizens, not necessarily always through state provision. But that vision is not yet clear. You know, it's a digital agenda for Europe. It's not at the heart of everything we do yet. Uh, secondly, I think that it therefore means that everybody has needs that have to be met, and I think the, the voluntary organisations, that's a great example. They that both they need, in order to be efficient, they need to be able to have digital platforms that are easy to use and maybe helping them to federate their needs so that there are big solutions available will help. I think cloud technology and a little bit of corporate social responsibility after hours help could deliver uh, transformative support for the voluntary sector. But equally, the voluntary sector is part of the solution to the skills gap. It's very striking. Uh, apprenticeship colleges in Malta, old people's homes in Norway, 
the Boy Scouts in Poland, the vehicles for bridging the digital skills gaps often come out of the voluntary or social services sectors. Thank you, Kivira. In, in Glasgow, in particular in Scotland, um, broadband uptake is well below uh, the, na the national average. Just to ask if there are any other examples across Europe where there are particular cities um, where broadband uptake, um, setting aside technology issues. Um, are there any other examples on a similar basis to Glasgow? So, so I'm assuming in Glasgow that the low uptake is both among, let's say, medium-sized companies and households. And Partic the particularly with households. Particularly households. So I think partly it's price. So I think the, the, the experiments I was talking about just now where you you bring in uh, not only high quality broadband but lower cost and you see what happens to use in a single uh, uh, housing development. I think that's a very important, interesting experiment. In uh, similar, if I think about uh, some parts of Malta, which Malta is a rich country, some parts of it are very poor. Uh, there it was a, a, a telco-led experiment. They gave away for no extra cost, the higher speed service for a year. And it was colossally, I mean, it was good for society, but it was good for them because a lot of people understood that the value was worth paying for, for them as households. And I think the experiments that are going on now in Glasgow and Edinburgh, as I understand it, to see whether if you give it for five instead of 25 pounds a month subscription, do people then say, okay, so in the end, that 20 pounds, that's a couple of rounds of drinks that's worth doing. I think that's the sort of that's that's one end of it. You have to you have to let people come into touch with this so that it's not just something aspirational and middle class. It's relevant to me. But there are places in, in the whole of Europe where that's true. I mean I, I think that what you see is um, that it's a bit like it's a bit like any social phenomenon. A, a, a healthy society, the gap between the rich and poor will be narrowed, but it will always be there, and there will always be hard-to-reach pockets at the bottom. And, and so what can you do about that? I think you have, to, you have to give tailored offers, so lower cost services, but also experiment with this, let us hold your hand and help you to see how it can serve your community. The, the, I've talked a lot about Norway and the Nordics. I actually believe that at this end of the problem quite soon, and it's already the case in some parts, Africa will teach us what to do. There are venture capitalists in America making a lot of money because they picked up some very cheap um, Bangladesh-developed uh, e-health applications and they use them in Colorado and it works, or they use them in Harlem and it works. So I think uh, if, you're, if you're trying to deal with this problem of uh, especially inner city uh, deprivation or exclusion, it may well be that the solutions that we need to look at and think about are going to be in emerging economies as much as in the rather rich neighbours we have. I think that point on, on price, uh, I think also there's perhaps aspect of um, skills and confidence yeah. um, with, with using those services and it was just to ask if there is funding available to help particularly those inner city areas where there is um, areas of high deprivation and inequality right across the city to see, and particularly those areas of high deprivation, whether there's funding there for training at that community level to build those skills and confidence. So, so again, it's, it's, it can be part of the structural funds model. Uh, it's the sort of thing that Europe... Europe does rather tentatively because we're so far away we can't see how to target the need uh, but there is there is scope there to, to do some work and there's definitely I think a lot of willingness to, to share inclusion learnings across Europe so I have teams who do uh, modest teams who do research around e-inclusion issues and over in the social employment part of the commission likewise but we wouldn't claim to be the big experts. Well, again, I mean, I'm not a tourist guide, but I think your, the Scottish office in Brussels, if you say to them, find me through the Committee of Regions and the Economic and Social Committee, people who are facing this problem in other countries, I want to come and meet them, 
that you can you can actually find in the European space uh, conversations like that where the lessons may be worth more than the checks you'll get from the Commission. But there's a bit of both. Really, on, on a on a different issue, just to ask whether you feel there are any um, cyber security issues um, that Scotland will need to address um, as we keep developing and, uh, and expanding um, our digital infrastructure. Right. So. I, cyber threats are everywhere. I do, uh, I, I, I'm not aware... I, do, no, I don't think there's any Scottish-specific threat. The really interesting question, whether it's about cybersecurity, hacking, or privacy, is, you know, shall we worry so much about that that we don't take advantage of the good things that this new set of technologies can offer? And I think there the answer has to be no. You know, if you wait until it's safe, you'll never go out. Uh, we do need to develop good security in parallel with developing our, our IT-enabled society. Um, this second only to Spectrum is an area where the responsible authorities at national level, they want to talk among those they trust. So typically that would mean uh, the UK, the French, the Germans, the Dutch, but not the Bulgarians, the Romanians. Blah, blah, blah. And I think that's a problem, and that's why the European Union has proposed that we actually have cooperation at 28. Around bioterror threats and pandemic health threats, it took 10 years, but we have got agreement that even sensitive intelligence-related stuff we should share. Peculiarly, on the cyber side, we haven't had um, I sometimes wonder since Snowden whether Snowden reveals why it's harder on cyber than on health, but we need to do it. But I don't think there's anything there that should make us think that oh, the water's too cold, I'm not jumping in. Simply we have to be aware of the risks. Okay. Um, you know, obviously there's a push for... Um, more and more things to be done uh, online and, you know, I'm thinking in this context, uh, claiming uh, welfare benefits. So there's, an op there's a, a danger that more people will feel excluded, um, you know, if we don't catch up on, on digital participation. And then those people who still would rather deal with a, a person face-to-face -face rather than um, fill in a, a form uh, electronically or just simply can't. So... You know, there's that balance to be struck, isn't there, between the sh move towards m everything being done online. We could also talk about it in terms of procurement and um, small to medium businesses, as we talked about earlier, not being up to speed on, on accessing contracts. So, you know, what's your view about what, how, how you achieve a balance? So, so I think that you, in, in, a, in a healthy society, you have to allow people the choice. So it's okay to be digital by default, but you have to have options. And the second thing I would say is, if we, if we put the right effort in, the technology can, re can itself reduce the risks of exclusion. I, the, the things that a smartphone can do for a blind person now, guiding them around a city if the lampposts have got the right chips on them, uh, talking to them, turning text into voice. It is amazing, but it's not yet available for everybody at low cost. But that which we develop for blind people who thankfully are a minority in our population helps the illiterate as well. The, the, the work on the user interface is increasingly developing really easy-to-use approaches but again, they tend to be rolled out first by the sort of glitzy corporate solutions and then public sector develops something else which is more or less unusable or not fit for purpose. And I know because we do it to ourselves in the Commission as well. So I think that we, we, we do need to gain the efficiencies, but we have to always allow people the choices and make sure the safety net is functioning. And I think the idea, you know, online welfare, online banking, I mean, these sorts of things are, are a big change in our societies. And everybody has to rethink. Our attention, for example, to uh, allowing people to say, well, I can't manage that. How do we make it easy and non-stigmatizing for somebody who actually can't work their way through the form to get help? Uh, at the other extreme, how do we make it 
how do we adjust our acceptance of risks? Uh, so if you've got to click in to claim your welfare, who says it's you and it's not your mother-in-law and you're in Barbados? So the authorities have to worry as well. And I think we just have to work through these changes the way we work through the changes from horses to motor cars. And it will take you know, 10 to 100 years, but we shouldn't let it stop us. I think that's the point. We have to, we have to understand the, the worries and deal with them and make clear as a society that we intend to deal with them. We're not just saying you have to run faster. But the key, as for the cybersecurity question, is not to say, well, it's all so terrible, we're not going to do it. Because at the top level, as I've said already, I think a vision that says we're going to do this and we're going to win and it's going to actually make us a stronger society, whether in Scotland or in Europe, that's one of the missing ingredients in success. When we were building railways, we believed we would make a success of it and it would be good, and it was. They weren't all built in the right place. IT is a bit the same. We're going to make mistakes and we have to advance in any case. But in the meantime, between that 10 and 100 years, do you think it's incumbent <laughs> on public authorities to task, let's say, voluntary organisations working in communities to um, provide the alternatives or provide the support for people who um, are not up to speed, if you like? Yes, absolutely. This, this I fully believe, and as I say, I think which authorities, which institutions a society picks will depend on each society. Uh, but the examples I gave were, were, were really... I think, extremely successful examples. So, so the granny in rural Poland doesn't understand how to use a computer. The Boy Scouts get a badge if they teach her. And then the local library, because they still have one, gives her access to the computer because she's not going to be able to afford a PC at home. That works for rural Poland. Something different will work in uh, the towns and, and countryside in, in Scotland. Ask Mr. Madeline to sum up. Is there do anybody else have any further no. questions? If I could just go back to um, the um, digital rollout. I mean, the Highlands and Islands project has uh, an aim of uh, covering around 84% of homes and businesses in the Highlands and Islands. The rest of Scotland project is about 96% or so. Um, in comparison with, for, if I take correctly what you said in Norway they would just go ahead and do that other small percentage with fiber it, but is there you know should we be saying that the Highlands and Islands the rest of Scotland must make sure that the rest is covered by satellite or or other or just wait until they can get everybody connected with fiber so I mean I think we, we don't have in Norway or in rural Germany what people call fibre to the farm. So I don't think even in, even in Norway they're actually giving everybody exactly that good a solution. But there is a commitment to giving everybody access. Now, maybe it won't be 100, maybe it'll be 30. I don't, I don't know. I haven't gone to those municipalities and discussed. But I think... The notion that 95% is enough is, is, is not good enough. We faced that problem ourselves in the last 18 months. The, 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 the basic connectivity for 100% goal in the digital agenda, we'd got to 96%. And so we had a discussion. Some of my colleagues said, we declare victory. And some of the others said, 4% is a lot. And in the end, what we have done there is to say, for the 4%, here is a, 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 a one-stop shop solution to find out how you can bridge that gap with satellites. So the offer is there, but we're not at the European level taking on the responsibility of delivering it to all those homes, which may be scattered in little pockets. I think the same is true. I, 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 don't, I don't believe people living in even remote areas accept that they will never get this good thing. Kind, and I think that's the question because they don't. When you're living a long way away and there isn't a telephone, you know that there's a there's a distance you have to travel. You can travel it more or less fast. When you have the telephone, you at least have voice until a tree falls on the line. With this stuff, there's no reason you should be disconnected. So if there's no reason, do we want a society where five percent are still disconnected, or do we actually want to say? we will map that 5% and find out whether we can fix it. And I think that's the, 
the, the, the thing we don't do in modern society is to say we'll look at it hard and try and fix it and come back and tell you. We're, we're, it's all the time, shall we commit to 100% or is 95% enough? Leading a debate will get the community to fix some of the problems itself, I think. So have you got any final messages for this committee and what do you think we should be pursuing and, and pushing government, governments to do at the moment? Well, so, so as I've tried to say throughout, I, I, I wouldn't be confident that I had messages you should be listening to, but I, I think that the, 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 the point I started with is really my, my strong belief that it is a mixture of society's assets in the intangibles, in the human skills, and the infrastructure over which society can exploit its assets. And if we have both of those points very strongly in our political vision and a vision of solidarity where nobody is left behind, most other things follow. I think that the, the second message I would say is that Europe sometimes is a source of funding, although as I've had to say in response to all those questions, it's never quite enough or in the right way or fast enough. What Europe is also a source of is uh, examples from elsewhere. The European space as a place where uh, decision makers from different territories can meet is colossally effective. And I think the strengths of people like the, the, the Edinburgh University team is that they've understood how to use the European space to strengthen the networks they already had. And I think through the Scottish representatives on the Rond Point Schumann in Brussels, there are opportunities to, to pick very specific problems and find out who in other countries has been tackling or is tackling the same problems. Because if they remain problems, it's often because they're too small if you just say it's a problem in one constituency in one country. When you discover it's a problem in one constituency in 28 countries, suddenly it needs a solution. So I think that that's the other part, that time spent making new links people to people with decision makers elsewhere in Europe can be transformative. Okay, thank you very much. And I think that's been uh, very useful and interesting evidence and stuff that we can incorporate into our future discussions on uh, digital uh, participation and connectivity. So thank you very much, Mr Madeline. And I briefly suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to leave the room.
we can resume and move on to agenda item two, which is petition PE1236. Um, the uh, item on the agenda today is to discuss a letter and report from Transport Scotland on the evaluation of safety measures at Lawrence Kirk in relation to petition PE1236. Members will see from the background note that there has been some correspondence which is included in the annexes to this paper. And can I welcome Nigel Don, the local member, to the meeting. Uh, can I invite comments and or views from members on the petition? Alex. Uh, I'm grateful for the further correspondence uh, by the Minister. Uh, I'm concerned that perhaps the level of understanding uh, of the, the needs of the area and the, the, the use that's made of the junction is still not as good as I would like to do, uh, like to have. Uh, however, I think it's a, a tremendous opportunity for us uh, having the local member here at the committee today to hear uh, his views on the subject and uh, the latest consultation he's had. Anyone else before I bring in Nigel? No? Okay, Nigel, over to you. Thank you very, very much, uh, convener, and, and thank you for the invitation to be here. That really is appreciated. Um, can, I, can I start by saying I, I welcome the analysis that Bear Scotland have done, simply because any data is, is useful. Um, and I also, as I'm sure we all do, welcome the reduction over the period in the total number of accidents in the area. I mean, regardless of how that happened, it has to be welcomed. Um, I note particularly that there does seem to have been effect at the north junction, um, and uh, I'm, I'm not surprised at that. I, I note since they put in a merge lane, uh, there have been apparently no accidents. Uh, that is perhaps no surprise. Certainly, again, it's welcome. I hope it stays that way. But as members will, I'm sure, recall, this petition is actually about the south junction. It's about the 937 as it comes up from uh, Mary Kirk and, and Montrose. And the information that I would particularly draw members' attention to is to be found in paragraph 410 of the analysis, where there are uh, indications that there have been three slight, uh, slight injury accidents beforehand and only two afterwards. But immediately underneath, you can see that there have been seven damage-only accidents beforehand and eight afterwards. Now, don't want to overdo small numbers, but if you simply add those together as minor accidents, then you've got 10 beforehand and 10 afterwards, and I think that is actually a reasonable indication of what it's actually like there. Um, so whilst I welcome the general reduction in accidents in the area, I don't think the data in front of us indicate that anything has particularly improved at the South Junction. It might just be that actually people driving there are now more aware of the issues, uh, and maybe in, in that regard less likely to improve. I'm also aware, as, as members are, of the Access to Lawrence Kirk study, which is being undertaken by Nestrans. I very much welcome that. I think that does give us an opportunity to come up with the right answer uh, and then to encourage the government to find the money to implement that right answer. Um, so in, in that regard, I think we are still going in the right direction. I, I'm very much hoping, convener, that members will feel able to keep this petition open. Um, might just be beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel. Um, could I also just, just make the point, and forgive me, members who've been here for a while will we'll, we'll recall this, but I, I am a cur uh, concerned, and I do occasionally hear people, not I have to say on this committee, saying, well, I drove past that junction at half past eight this morning, and it was fine, um, as if somehow that deals with the matter. And I would just like to keep putting on the record, if you want to see what's happening there, you need to be there between 6.30 and 7.30 in the morning. That's when the rush hour is coming up from Mirikirk, and that's when it's at most dangerous, and you will see that on some of the videos which are on the internet. Um, and the other point is on Friday afternoon, and I'm sure, Convener, you will be aware of this, the, 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 the rush hour from Aberdeen more or less starts at lunchtime on a Friday, and quite honestly, it's more or less continuous all afternoon. And on the Fridays when I do a surgery in Lawrence Kirk in the late afternoon, I do not attempt to come across that junction. I actually come back to Brechin through Fetakan. Um, it's, it's twice as far, but it's plainly the safest thing to do. And I think that comment will resonate with most of my constituents who understand that this is a junction they would just rather avoid because, quite frankly, it is dangerous uh, and it really does need to be sorted. And, of course, the, the accidents continue. Uh, I've taken the opportunity to report experiences on the road 
uh, at previous committee meetings and as I drove home last Thursday uh, in the early part of the evening, there were a number of police cars in attendance at an accident on the southbound carriageway where at the point where the traffic slows down for the 50 mile an hour limit there had been a concertina accident. Uh, and these things, uh, it's an example of uh, how regardless of the other issues uh, we have experienced or uh, seen or discussed regarding this junction, the fact that there is a 50 mile an hour limit necessary on one of the busiest parts of our trunk road network uh, is in itself a, a disadvantage. I mean, I think there is absolutely no doubt that there is a need for a grade separated junction at Lawrence Kirk. Um, and I think the report is very welcome. I was actually at a meeting, an S Trans meeting on Friday. Um, and what, I mean, the government has always said it's got to be, got to be funded by developer contributions. And I don't think we're going to get away from that. But one of the things that came up at this meeting, which I found immensely encouraging, is that instead of you know one developer or at Lawrence Kirk having to fund this, that they're um, they're actually going to have a develop a development bank, so that a number of developers will pay into the bank, and the bank can can fund it. So it'll be a fund rather than just as I say one one developer. I think that's a, a very positive move forward. What needs to happen, though, is that Angus Council need to come on board with this as well, because although it is in an Aberdeenshire, is very much traffic from Angus that is contributing to the, the traffic on the Mary Kirk Road. So I think it's incumbent on Angus to get on board, um, but I still think that the work that Nestrans are doing, and to be fair, Transport Scotland, is, as, as others have said, um, a reason for keeping this um, this petition open. Um, but I think since the last time we discussed this, there's certainly, um, and the last time it was before the committee, um, there has certainly been a lot of progress, albeit in the eyes of some people far too slow, but um, things are moving in the right direction. So I would agree that we keep the petition open. That in his letter, the minister makes it clear that he will continue to update us on progress. Mm. Yeah. I mean, there's still, you know, should it be at the south, should it be at the north, should it be a Lincoln Road to the north? Um, and then what is the effect on traffic through Lawrence Kirk? So all of these things have got are still being monitored and still have to be taken into consideration. Yes, Nigel. Yeah, can, can I just echo what you said, Kavina? I think that is actually an important point people need to understand. And I suspect many people are now beginning to understand we don't necessarily need a flyover at the South Junction. If there's going to be only one flyover, it needs to be in the right place. That might well not be at what is currently the South Junction, and that is what the current study really needs to work out, because the last thing we want is everybody then having to go up Lawrence Kirk High Street, which, if anybody can visualise it, is uh, a slalom. OK, so we agree to keep the petition open. OK, uh, at our next meeting, we're going to be starting the consideration of amendments uh, to the stage two of the housing bill and members are reminded that the deadline for lodging amendments for parts one to three of the bill is 12 noon this friday and with that i close the meeting yeah.